Protestant and Catholic communities to form the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition. Have you ever in Northern Ireland seen a group of all shades of political color sitting in one place at one time, all ready to talk to each other? In May Blood, the coalition found a formidable campaign manager ready to take on the most outraged men. Women are 52% of the population in Northern Ireland. We have a right to be at the talks table. It's our future's being talked about, and it shouldn't be talked about solely by women. The coalition took a bold line on including the IRA's political wing, Sinn Féin, at the peace talks. We believe there should be all violence should be taken out of society, but we do not believe decommissioning should be a precondition to the talks. The Northern Ireland Women's Coalition gained two seats at the multi-party peace talks. Ireland's president, Mary Robinson, is heartened by this kindling of interest in politics. They need to make no apologies for the fact that they speak for the reality of the groups and the communities that they work with and that they have worked with in difficult times and now they need to have the opportunity to gather that together and move forward and redefine politics. Open it up. That's it. So that gives you a bit of the context of the old age. And there are quite a few of our Women's Coalition members in the audience. So thank you very, very much for coming and being here. So I'm going to hand to May. Uh, he's got to rush off afterwards. He can, 45 minutes will do. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the Baroness. Thank you very much, Jane. I'm delighted to be here this morning for a number of reasons, as Jane said. We've been friends for many, many years, but that's not the reason I'm here. I'm here because of Europe. I've always believed we should have stayed in Europe. I think it was the biggest mistake when people voted to, to leave, which in Northern Ireland, of course, we didn't. Um, we, on the shackle, we benefited greatly from Europe and from the influence there. But I want to say, you know, uh, even though the film shows us at the Women's Coalition and, and fighting politics, I'm a community worker. I work at grassroots level, and I believe if Jane was elected, that's exactly where she would work. She would work in our community. She just wouldn't fly to Europe, and we would never hear of her again. Uh, I always remember six in my mind some years ago, they had a vote in Parliament, in the European Parliament, who was the most popular MEP, and it turned out to be Ian Paisley. And Ian Paisley only attended three times that year, but every time he went, he made sure the cameras was there. And the reason that I would support Jane is because I don't know anybody who knows more about Europe than Jane Morris. She lives and breathes it, and that's what we need. We need people there. If it comes about that there is a, a sitting in Europe, we need somebody there speaking for the people of Northern Ireland. Really speaking for, not just speaking for party lines, not just speaking for what the party tells them to say, but really speaking for what they really, really believe in. And as I say, you know, and Jane and I have been together many, many years. We've done many, many things. And as she says, unfortunately, I have to rush off. Uh, I go to my other passion, which is integrated education. Uh, I have a fundraiser for it at dinner hour, and I have to get up to down around to speak at it. But you know, if you look even at our recent elections, and I was saying this earlier, if you look at the recent elections, things are changing in Northern Ireland. People are fed up. People are really fed up with the old rhetoric. You know, and it's all party line. I mean, I was in Westminster for 19 years, and I understand what the party line is when the whip says you vote for this. Whether you agree with it or not, you vote for it. And I suppose, in a sense, that's where I blotted my copybook because very often I didn't. And then the whip used to say to me, could you not disappear for an hour? Uh, could you not do that? I said, no, no, no. Could you not abstain? No, don't believe in abstaining. I believed in voting the way I believe people on the ground wanted to vote. And I think if we send Jane to Europe, that's exactly what we get. We'll get someone who will speak for us. I was saying earlier, you know, we have loads of politicians in Northern Ireland, and on Friday and Saturday we've got 400 more in who will speak for us. We need somebody to speak to us. And I think that's where Jane Morris comes in. I think Jane is in touch with the community. She's in touch with what's going on. She's in touch also with what's in Europe and what's possible for Northern Ireland. Let's face it, when we voted, when the vote came out in the referendum, I don't believe there were many, many people who even understood what the vote was about. You know, and I've spoken to dozens of people. I sat on the committee in the British Irish Parliament Assembly for a number of years around Brexit. And I remember saying at the beginning, 
that when I first heard the word Brexit one morning on the breakfast television, I heard the word Brexit for the first time, and I thought it was a new breakfast cereal. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember saying, I wonder what that would taste like. <laughs> the interesting thing was, it didn't turn out to be a breakfast cereal. It turned out to be a dog's dinner. And unfortunately, we're still struggling with that. But there are four letters in the word Brexit that I really like. <laughs> E-X-I-T. And we've got to get out of it. And I think, you know, the support of, we can support Jane to get through there and have a voice for us. I think that's what it's all about. It's giving people, ordinary people, a sense that somebody's there rec recognising them and recognising their need, not just on party lines. And I'm delighted to be here, Jane, really delighted to be here this morning. I'm sorry I have to rush away, but my other passion's just too strong for me. I'm sorry, folks, but even in integrated education, change is coming. And change is coming, we've seen that in the recent elections. So even in that, let's push, let's push for that change. Let's get a new voice in Europe, not just a party line. Thank you. May blood, um, Baroness. Uh, what can I say? She's uh, the, that sort of an endorsement from a woman like that is gold dust, isn't it? <clears throat> it's fantastic. Uh, the work you've done. Uh, it's been a total privilege to work with you, and the hands-on approach and the understanding that you have is second to none. And yeah, I've had a lovely story. I'm sorry. This this morning's going to be full of lovely stories. I remember May careful telling me, Nigerian, <laughs> May telling me when she first went to the House of Lords, um, she she got into a taxi, and uh, the taxi driver said, "Oh, Baroness Blood, do you live in an estate?" And she said, "I live in a council estate, and I've only just got an inside toilet." <laughs> the, you know, they, and she was staying in the YMCA. Uh, in in London at the beginning, because the House of Lords, you know, what a difference this person was. And I'm going to use this moment to mention someone who dear departed Mo Molum, no. because it was Mo Molum put her hand on May's shoulder and our shoulders back then, right. and and more or less made us what we are today. So so that's someone who you know we can only say we wish she was here. Yeah, absolutely. There you are. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to hand over because I know you have to run. So yep. thank you very much. Let me give her another round of applause. Thank you. Now, from the oldest of my old friends, I had to say that one after she left. Yeah, wonderful me. I've got to come to. A very, very new friend, and uh, I'm not having to even look at his name and put my glasses on, but uh, Ray McKim, uh, just after the referendum, uh, Rona, uh, who's at the back there, uh, arrived at my door in tears the next morning, and I'd never met her before. Uh, it was her husband said, go to Jane Mario. She said, this is awful, the referendum. Uh, this is terrible, and her husband said, "Go to Jane Morris. She, she'll do something about it." <laughs> and so the next, she arrived at my door, and the three of us, with Ray, have been in a small group in Bangor, battling Brexit since the day of the referendum. And so and the story, Ray's story, which is wonderful, is that uh, <laughs> a couple of months ago, dare yeah. I say, yes, we, uh, he invited me for coffee, and he said. Um, do you think uh, that uh, I should stand for the local government elections in Bangor? And I said, go for it. He did. And a couple of days ago, he was elected. May I introduce our local councillor, independent for Bangor, Mr. Wayne. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, everyone. Um, it's a real honour to be here. Um, we're really speaking about connections, um, the connection between these two wonderful women, how the connection they formed with women in Northern Ireland, how Northern Ireland formed that connection which we've benefited greatly from with Europe. And as Jane said, we're talking about the connection that happened around a, a kitchen table. Um, not always do these great connections have to happen at Westminster or Brussels or the UN. 
um, great things can happen in ordinary places. And that's something that I'm very passionate about. Um, when we met, um, one of those things that was noticeable about Jane was that she's one of those people that you meet in life who, when faced with a challenge and a difficulty, and we were devastated with the outcome of the referendum, Jane isn't somebody who stays with the challenge or the difficulty, but moves very quickly to what the possibility is. And it was a real honour to spend those months as we met over and over to begin to look at what was actually possible. Northern Ireland has benefited so much from our connection with Europe and we really wanted to find a way that we could enhance that and, and establish that connection without absolutely losing it altogether. Um, you know, for me, the frustration that came with it wasn't just a frustration about the referendum. It began to bleed into other parts of my thinking and I began to realise that maybe it wasn't enough to be a lobbyist. And maybe it wasn't enough just to click like on a Facebook page. And maybe it wasn't even enough to turn up at a rally and say, well, I'm here to support you. But that maybe there was more that could be done. I live in a beautiful part of the world. Um, I hope you've all been to Bangor, and if you haven't, get there very soon. Um, you might have fond memories of it. I know that having spoken to a lot of people in Bangor, they do remember it when it was at its heyday. Um, and it's not just something that's happened to Bangor in the last decade or two, many of the cities across Europe that I've been able to work with through my work in community development and urban regeneration have faced the same challenges. But through my work I began to see and realise of course that something more was possible. That we could look at community development as Baroness Blood was saying, we could look through the mechanisms of community development and urban regeneration to bring a town back on its feet again. And through a series initially of chance meetings, I met people who shared this passion. And of course, I thought I should convince them to stand as an independent, and that would be great. <coughs> you know, that would be their job to do. Um, but through those chance meetings, we then developed much more formal discussions with people, maybe those people who had worked in urban regeneration, those people who had worked in corporate law as traders, as passionate citizens and residents of the town of Bangor. So as Jane said in early February, I decided that I would stand for the election in Ards and North Down Borough Council. I'm really not political. <laughs> in fact, I know very little. When I turned up at the, the count on Friday, they asked me which candidate I was with. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but in early February, I decided to stand with no experience, but experience where it mattered, I felt, in community development, working with people, seeing lives and communities change. And as, the, as time passed, a, a campaign team emerged. And as that grew, we, we saw groups of people grow around the projects that we were working on. We saw canvassers appear. And you know within six weeks, they canvassed 400 hours. Mm -hmm. And they were just so committed to hanging posters, sticking stickers, knocking doors, raising funds. Because when we are together, we are stronger than when we are separate. And that's a message for Bangor. It's a message for our country that I hope that Jane will take forward. So, as Jane said, the outcome on Friday evening was that as an independent, passionate about community, passionate about urban regeneration, we took the seat at 933 votes. Oh. And it's a vote. <laughs> and it's a vote that says we are stronger together than when we are when we are separate. So please get behind Jane. She has our well-being at heart. She, as Baroness Blood said, intricately knows our relationship to Europe. She understands the mechanisms. She has built relationships with the people. And most of all, I'd say get behind Jane because her motivation comes from heart. She's doing this because she wants Northern Ireland to flourish and grow. So please get behind the campaign and vote for Jane to remain. <laughs> I'm 
just going to thank you so much, Ray. I mean, I'm going to need a bag of tissues here on the table because this is emotional. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask Dream A, Kyle, to come to the, to the stage. Not, not because, don't worry, I haven't said he's going to speak, but uh, I just want to let you know that Drew has been my, what's, what was, I've been calling expert in uh, peace building when, in, in, in the work I do in Brussels. And um, he's he's specialist in Lebanese uh, refugees, ex- uh, refugees in the Lebanon, etc. So it's been a very valuable uh, aid to me. So I'm going to keep him beside me in case there's any particularly tough questions that I may have uh, about the, the sort of peace building work and that sort of thing. And now I'm going to take to my feet. And uh, and uh, my first question is, where's the BBC? <laughs> Indeed. Good. That might go out on Slugger O'Toole. Thank you, (laughs) Slugger O'Toole, for coming and doing the live stream. Thank you very much. Where's the press? Oh, don't worry. We'll we'll let them know we're here. Right. Okay. So, obviously, I wanted to start by saying, where's, you know, what the reason I'm standing for election to the European Parliament. Uh, After years outside politics, as you can see, it's, it's absolutely because of Brexit, no question. Uh, it's brought the fire back to my belly, as they say. Um, I profoundly believe that Brexit poses the most serious threat to political, economic and social stability in Northern Ireland. And I feel it's my duty to stand against it. Brexit doesn't just shut the door on the best trade deal we could have in Europe. It slams the door in the face of opportunity for our younger people to work, to study, to live and learn uh, from a civilization, the European civilization, which is part of our very being, of our essence. And, and I think it's, it's important to say now that Europe isn't isn't just about money and markets, but that's all uh, everyone seems to talk about. It's about culture, it's about art, it's about entertainment, it's about fun, it's about so much more. It's Da Vinci, it's Dali, it's it's Tchaikovsky, it's 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 Two Door Cinema Club, it's Snow Patrol and Banger. It's you know, it's it's Europe is so much more than that. It's also about <sighs> pizza. And spaghetti, uh, but it's also about fish and chips, and they're going to miss it. With all the talk also of independence in Scotland and a border poll in Ireland, Brexit also risks the breakup of the UK. The chaos created since the referendum is proof that we are totally unprepared for the consequences of Brexit. Hard or soft, and we haven't even left yet. So, I want to explain why I feel so passionate about it, as you can tell. And uh, to do that, I have to go back to 1973. That was the year we joined the European Union, and it was also the year I went to Coleraine University to do a degree in European Studies. Uh, Me and Europe have been walking in parallel lines ever since. Uh, 73, as you know, was also one of the worst years of our troubles. And that's another reason I chose to study Europe. Because I wanted to get out. Away from the violence, the sectarian, the hatred uh, that was stalking the streets of Belfast where I lived when I was a teenager. Back then, the only voice of reason, equality, mutual understanding and respect I heard was the European voice. And I have to pay tribute to John Hume because he spoke with the European voice. I suppose I was from a unionist family so I couldn't, in those days, it was, it was difficult to cross divides, but his voice really did bring Europe home to Northern Ireland. And I admit that so many of us, including me, sat on our hands during the 30 years of the Troubles. My only way out was to escape. Uh, And I escaped to Brussels and came home six years later to work for the BBC. (laughs) 
Um, it wasn't until I became head of the EC office uh, in 92 uh, and was involved in setting up the European Peace Programme that I met the rail people fighting uh, to make sure Belfast didn't become Bosnia. And that was the sort of May blood, but many others here here today too. Um, and then went on to help set up the Women's Coalition and got elected to the first Northern Ireland Assembly. And I was deputy speaker at that assembly. Uh, and that brought me really into contact with all sides of the political divide. And it taught me a hugely important lesson, which is the vital need to understand and respect difference. We don't have anything to be afraid of. All we've got to do is get to know each other, to understand each other. We don't have to agree. We learned that in the Women's Coalition. We came from all different parts and we, and we didn't always agree. But it was important that we listened and learned each other's side. Um, it's that conviction that takes me on a path to the European Parliament, uh, where I stand, as you know now, as an unapologetic supporter of the EU in Northern Ireland and campaigner for a people's vote on the deal with an option for the UK to remain. And I've got a short clip to show now to show why a people's vote is a very good idea. Thank you. Daughters, no. In the political parties of Northern Ireland, the British degree, it is the people of Northern Ireland who will decide democratically their own future. The agreement that has emerged from the Northern Ireland peace talks opens the way for the people there to build a society based on enduring peace, justice, I'm sure the positive news of today will continue to build on that. And now we must go to the people and make this agreement work. Yes, 71.12 percent. It is firstly important that having negotiated what was a, a fairly radical new approach that we have the support of the population. It would have been very easy to cast the same had it not been validated. We knew the detail. Uh, the agreement was posted to every household in Northern Ireland so people could read it. That's why it was such a momentous occasion and gave such a powerful political mandate. How do we go to the people? Because the people need ownership of the process, ownership of the agreement. Once that it had been ratified by such a majority of people, then it, it, it had a, a seal of approval, a popular approval. I think it's very essential to have a referendum so that in effect the ownership of Brexit would be owned by the people. Twenty years ago on the Good Friday referendum, we had the detail, we went to the people, we said, you decide now and see if what the politicians have done is good enough. And, and, and that's what needs to happen when we have no Brexit. People need to be clear about the implications. There needs to be an, um, an honesty in terms of what's been put on. The first was all for the city. The second has got to be an informed decision, which hopefully would put this matter to rest in the only way now that it can be put to rest. Beautiful video produced by, yes, <laughs> produced by two wonderful movements that have started since Brexit. Uh, the uh, People's Vote, Northern Ireland uh, have their own, and also Our Future, Our Choice, uh, Northern Ireland. And they've been out leafleting and doing things over the past few years and fighting. And, and, this, and this argument they're using now, uh, which, which is so, so valid, you know, the Good Friday Agreement we got, you've heard it, you know, we, we got the deal posted in our letterboxes. We knew what we were getting uh, and we knew what we were voting for. So, so that, that's the argument for a people's vote. And of course, so a people's vote on the deal, but I want that any deal has very special recognition for Northern Ireland. And you can call it what you want, special status or unique or whatever it is, uh, but it needs to have something special for Northern Ireland. That's very important. And... Um, it's, I'm, I'm not afraid to say, I hope 
that America doesn't mind if they're listening. But I think the EU has done more for the peace process in Northern Ireland uh, than any other outsider, including America. The EU has poured billions into cross-community, cross-border work, and yet America gets all the glory. You know, where was the EU in our 20th celebrations? Where was it? Nobody says thank you to the EU. And, and for me, that's a huge problem with the European Union. It doesn't shout loud enough. So it's to blame too. Um, but when it does, its voice is drowned out. And I don't know whether you remember the tabloid titles. Up yours, Dolores, was one I remember. Uh, bendy bananas. And, and also, <laughs> the lack of interest and engagement by the media... And that includes the BBC. And I have often said that our public service broadcaster had 40 years of failure in its public service duty to educate and inform the public. And that is us about what is the European Union. And I definitely charge that. Now, maybe that'll the one that gets the headline today rather than something more constructive. I wish that more would be done there. So I'm standing for the European Parliament not only because the EU needs a voice in Northern Ireland, because, but because the majority of people in Northern Ireland who voted to remain need to be heard in Brussels and London. Uh, yes, I've total faith in the European project and all it's done for Northern Ireland. And even now, during the Brexit negotiations, it's bending over backwards to protect our interests in these negotiations. It would take decades to replace the benefit we get from being part of the European Union, not only in terms of funding for our farmers, our economic development, our peace process, but also in terms of trade with our closest neighbours. We might live on the edge of Europe, but we belong at the centre, and that's where we were. Yes, we helped shape the Europe of today. we fighting wars and building peace and progress and prosperity with our European neighbours, but now with Brexit we're cutting the cord and turning our back on over 500 million people after 45 years because we never really bothered to see them as friends. You know, they were always seen as foreign, faceless and too far away, but we've got to learn that they are. Uh, by the way, I'm not saying, and this is important, I'm not saying that Brexiters were wrong <laughs> to vote the way they did. I'd probably have voted Brexit if I believed all that was said. You know, false promises, misinformation. Uh, I've said, I've described it as being, we were sold a pup. But that is putting it mildly. So, how do we find a way out? As Ray said, that we, I, like, I like the solutions. Uh, without, by the way, without being accused of being anti-democratic. And that's more democracy, and that means putting the vote back to the people. Um, and this special recognition for Northern Ireland um, because we are unique not only do we have a frontier on our doorstep but we all have the right to keep our European citizenship as we all know uh, thanks to the Good Friday Agreement my petition by the way uh, which was out, I put out immediately after the referendum uh, to keep Northern Ireland in the EU as part of the UK uh, has coming close to 7,000 signatures, but I've got to get more. And, uh, and so spread the word about it and let's keep, keep that coming. Um, another old argument, I was ready to answer the arguments, is, you know, we, we, joined the EU, we joined the EU as one. We have to leave as one. But don't forget, that was 1973. Look at what has changed since then. We've had devolution. We've had the Northern Ireland Assembly, we've had the Good Friday Agreement, and not in that order. And, and this, is, this is something that has changed so much, and this is why the, our voices need to be heard here in Northern Ireland. Now, I'm just going to come into the end of this, and I want to move on to my, I'm fixing it, move on to my campaign. And there's that, that chorus, don't worry, don't worry, babies are welcome. <laughs> Lovely. Um, I'm promoting what I'm calling the power of positive politics. And I think during the, the elections, both 
local England here. I think we've, we've started to see the emergence of the power of positive politics. But I'm going to base it on, and you'll appreciate this too, what Ulster's quite famous for, saying no. So, no negative campaigning, no posters and only a few leaflets, as you've seen here, and no Brexit. The three no's. Uh, in two short weeks, obviously, I've got an awful lot of um, a mountain to climb, but I think I want to talk much more about my campaign because it's going to be different using the power of pol positive politics. And I want to more or less, well, I want to say that I'm planning to run a sort of a virtual campaign. And I want to mention right now, with thanks to the great help from the wonderful local artist, Keith Drury, who's here at the moment. Take, are you allowed to take a bar? Or do you know? No, I know not. Anyway, wait till, wait till we see what you've done for us. Uh, and his wife, Deborah, thank you. Uh, he's created a fabulous piece of art, which will be my poster. But it won't be on lampposts. It's going to be on social media. Ready to go. Isn't that absolutely yeah. incredible? <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> um, you know, I, it, 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 it says it all, doesn't it? Now, for those of you who don't know, my Morris Minor was part of my campaign back in the Women's Coalition days. And I used the Morris Minor, and I got the headline, Morris is no minor. And look, he's written Morris 1 on the, on the number plate. And isn't it just gobsmacking? It's so beautiful. And now I can send that, we can send that round. Instead of sticking posters on lampposts and doing all, all that sort of thing. So isn't it just beautiful? I'm very, very lucky to have the support of... I, I can't even find words to... He's wonderful, wonderful, not only in his art, but also in his way of thinking. And by the way, um, he's a patron of... Uh, of Charity for Autism, if that's right. And, um, and I was going to have his cards here, but they're on sale for that purpose. So let me give that a plug too. Um, where do I go? Uh, <laughs> yes, so the, you may know that, um, that, I hope that's not a walkout. Don't worry, don't worry at all. Uh, thanks for coming, David Gavin, who's the chair of the MAC, and I'm awfully glad he's going now, because it means, can I say, thank you very much to the MAC uh, for hosting this event, and uh, thank you. Um, the, I heard on radio this morning, and I'm not sure of the exact detail of it, but I think that there's a very major event taking place in Paris about climate change. And I think that's very important that I let you know exactly what my plans are for the campaign. Uh, by the way, I met, I met the young Greta Thornberg in Brussels and I had a photograph of her, but there's another young, inspirational woman. Um, and, but I give you the story of this because when I was finding out how, what we should do for the elections, I was informed that I needed to have 820,000 leaflets ready for the Royal Mail this week. 820,000, so that they can do the free post into every household in Northern Ireland. Because now, given my, I, I did a bit of research, and the research was saying, uh, I, I, it was a doctor I met uh, who said, you're, I said, I'm standing for the European elections. She said, European elections? First I heard we were having them was when I got a letter from my school saying, my, my daughter's school saying the school will be closed on the 23rd of May. That's the first that one a member of the public heard that there's going to be an alert European election. We haven't been informed. So what did I do? First of all, we don't know that there is, and that's another thing because of all that's going on. But, but... I phoned the Royal Mail and I phoned the Electoral Office and the Electoral Commission, etc., etc., to find out, come on here, surely you couldn't, these are exceptional circumstances. 
You couldn't possibly expect all of those candidates to produce hundreds of thousands of leaflets at thousands of pounds in cost, not only to our pockets but also the environment, mm. uh, without even knowing there was definitely going to be a European election. How could we possibly afford whether we're an independent or whether we're a, a, a massive party machine? We couldn't afford So I came up with a suggestion and I said, wouldn't it be a good idea if using the free post of the Royal Mail, what you did was sent out a leaflet explaining what the European Parliament is, how many MEPs there are, what they do, and give them a list of all the ones on the one sheet. So no more of those leaflets coming through your door, just one mail drop from, from the Royal Mail and explaining everything in one place. Yep, I'm getting nods from the audience here, and of course, it, 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 there's no time for that. But maybe we'll get that for the next, in the next five years for the next European Parliament election. But at least it'll increase awareness. Um, oh, yes, I want to say finally that I've got another great idea. And by the way, I'm full of these, <laughs> sorry to say. Um, I've got another great idea for, for the polling stations. Uh, I was out on the campaign with Ray uh, at the polling station and I was uh, handing out the leaflets and a couple of hours spent there and I realised this is tiring for North Down. What on earth is it going to be like for the whole of Northern Ireland with every single polling station? And how am I going to, in two weeks' time, get a whole machine up and running? Uh, uh, and uh, in spite of all the goodwill from all the women's coalitioners from the days gone by, etc., and everybody else, and the European movement is another one I have to mention too. But in spite of all of that, uh, there's no way we're going to be able to get people standing at every polling station. So, what I'm saying is, get anyone who loves Europe and who believes in Europe and and wants us to stay in Europe. All they have to do is go out to their polling station with a couple of blue and yellow balloons and hand out flowers. And they can be blue and yellow or not. And they can say, vote Jane to remain on the way as they pass. But n you don't need the leaflets. You don't need, you just need, you know, this, this could be making this, not, not me as an independent or as a party, but a movement to actually stop what's happening to us. It's vital. Um, <laughs> obviously, I'm, I'm going to end there because I'm going to end with 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 just just thanks and and two people sitting in the audience here, Jerry and Miriam. They have been the machine behind where I've got so far. You know, it's 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 wonderful that they're that they're pushing me into doing it. Oh, organisation, that's something I'm not good at, and I'll admit that. Uh, and, and, and also, uh, Jeff and Margaret, and look, there's loads of people I haven't mentioned, and I, I should, but, um, you know, thank you to all of you. Um, I, in my BBC days, I was known as the queen of the mixed metaphors. <laughs> so I'm operating on a shoestring, I'm flying by the seat of my pants, and I'm now ready to get this show on the road. <laughs> I, have, I can't resist one more, and it's something that I think is, it's Jodie Mitchell. Does anyone know the quote I'm gonna go? Don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone? They pave paradise and they put up a parking lot. <laughs> well, I'm for one, I'm not ready to park in that lot. <laughs> okay, that's why I'm standing for the European elections. All the very best. Thank you very much for coming.